her home in Maine. But state troopers say they will arrest her if she walks outside. So who's going to blink first? Plus, what if you could swallow a pill that sweeps your bloodstream for diseases, warning you of cancer or a heart attack? It's for real, and we'll tell you who's developing it. And meet the guy who's been responsible for every drop of this stuff. Thanks, Kevin. Wild turkey. Produced for the past 60 years. Now that's a real person on the real story, top of the hour. That show could get really interesting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, brand new testimony in the trial of a university researcher charged with killing his own wife. Police say this man, Dr. Robert Ferrante Rush, ordered cyanide and then gave it to his wife mixed into an energy drink, promising it was going to help her get pregnant. Now, one of his coworkers has testified that he placed a rush order for, quote, the best and purest cyanide. Another said it was the first time that cyanide had been in that lab for six years. Joining us now to talk about it, criminal defense attorney Diana Eisman and former prosecutor Dan Shore. Good to see you both. Good to see you. All right, Good Dan, um, let's talk about this because mm -hmm. we have this fellow lab worker saying, um, you know, he, he placed this unusual order for cyanide, not something they had generally used in the lab. She testified that he'd been acting strange. Um, what do you do with that? What do you think the jury's going to do with that? Well, it's pretty incriminating, and there's a lot of incriminating facts here. He's a lab researcher. Two days before his wife falls ill and ends up dying from cyanide poisoning, he's arranging for a 24-hour express delivery of cyanide, even though the lab has no need for that. Later on, when after she dies, and the police say it's from cyanide poisoning, the family wants an autopsy, and he's fighting against that. The investigators looked at his computers and found internet searches before she died, looking into divorce, looking into cyanide poisoning, reading about another case of cyanide poisoning. And then after she dies, he's looking on the computer or someone is looking on his computer about how to erase Google searches. So that's all very incriminating evidence against him. Yeah, and Diana, uh, there's also a report that after he was interviewed by police, after his wife died, that he was doing, uh, allegedly, um, that there was a Google search performed for um, how to remove traces of toxins or, or poisons. I mean, can you distinguish that away, uh, plant some kind of reasonable doubt with these jurors, or do you think all of this just adds up to bad news for his defense? I think that it's really important to note that this is not a, a dumb man. This is a very highly educated medical researcher. And there is evidence that cyanide has been used in his lab, even though it was uh, quite some time ago. It is possible that he had some sort of reason for bringing cyanide back into the lab and maybe even conducting uh, those particular Google searches. What's really important is for the uh, defense team to humanize him to this jury, to make it clear that he had some sort of reason, actual professional reason, why why he brought cyanide into the and that it's just too simple. It's to, it doesn't quite add up as far as if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. The evidence here is just too simple. They're, they've got to be missing something. All right, Dan, so we all know that in a criminal trial like this, it's all about just planning that reasonable mm -hmm. doubt. I mean, if you have one juror who has a reasonable doubt about any of this, um, about his guilt, uh, then he's home free. Right. This is, this is a circumstantial case. You don't have anyone actually seeing him give his wife the cyanide poisoning. But circumstantial cases can be very, very powerful. And this one seems to be you have, you have him ordering the murder weapon, cyanide, right before the suspicious Internet searches and other strange behavior. A defendant in a murder trial often doesn't testify, but I think here he's going to have to testify. He's going to have some explanation. Or he then would you let him take the stand if he was your client? I'd have to hear him speak first, uh, but in a situation like this, I tend to agree. I think he's going to have to come up with some reason why he needed cyanide in the lab. And really, I think another important point is that the, his wife, the deceased, the victim in this case, was not uh, an unintelligent person. This, she's also a physician, and so it doesn't make sense that he was able to convince her that a creatine drink is going to help her get pregnant. So, the, like I said, there's a few things here that are not quite adding up for me, and I think, yes, he would probably have to take the stand to, again, humanize himself to that jury and to provide some sort of explanation as to why all signs point to the fact that he may have killed his wife. Yeah, Dan, I have to say that did strike me as a little bit unusual that uh, with her expertise and her background that she would be so willing to take a drink from him allegedly to help her fertility. Well, we know that they were having trouble conceiving. There were text messages earlier that day about this being a good time for her to try to conceive. 
So he's a lab researcher. The prosecution is saying that he suggested this creatine drink and that he put cyanide into it. They have not shown all the evidence about why they believe that, but they put that in their opening statement. And you have all this other incriminating evidence. So we have to see how the case continues, how they prove that. And as I said before, I believe the defendant's going to have to testify and try to explain these facts. All right, Dan, Diana, truth can be stranger than fiction. Uh, it sounds like a movie, but we'll see how it plays out in real life. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Re retired Major Leaguer Jose Canseco now recuperated.